We're ready to go this afternoon, and I, I'm great pleasure to welcome Dr. Erica Mallory Bride, who's uh, a, a trained doctor, worked in uh, accident and emergency, among other uh, things, and uh, she's going to tell you about fire and about IGNIR. So uh, please welcome uh, Erica Mallory Bride. Thank you. Hello. So I'm the founder of FIRE, which is the Physicians Health Initiative for Radiation and Environment. And I set up this group quite a few years ago now, specifically actually to address this issue, which is uh, non-ionizing radiation exposures and vulnerable groups, including children. This is umbrellaed by the Radiation Research Trust, which is a registered UK charity. And I sit on a number of other international advisory bodies. So this is Hippocrates, and can I just have a show of hands in the audience? How many medical doctors do we have in the audience right now? Now, can you put your hand down only if you have never completed a course, a specific educational course in non-ionizing radiation health? Okay, thank you. Um, which brings me on to why this is sometimes an uncomfortable subject, the elephant in the room. And there's obvious socio-economic implications, but I think the other reason that sometimes this is hard to talk about is because of a huge lack of education on this subject. Even very eminent British doctors have often had no training, so they feel really uncomfortable discussing it at all. So I'm going to give a very quick overview of non-ionizing radiation and particular vulnerabilities of children. We're going to talk about mechanisms of damage starting at a cellular level and working up through systemic and finally diagnostic endpoints, including cancer. Accountability and ethical paths forward. So the non-ionizing radiation spectrum is vast and we have ionizing radiation which we know causes DNA damage via... Uh, ionization, but we also now know that non-ionizing radiation can also cause DNA damage, albeit via indirect mechanisms. And I'm going to focus on the radio communication part of the spectrum, but that's not to say that there aren't very important effects lower down in the extremely low frequency uh, band. And we'll touch on these through the presentation as well. So some fast facts are um, that Radio frequency radiation can damage biology at very low intensity or so-called non-thermal exposures. There are no current UK safety limits to protect against that kind of damage. We currently use the ICNIRP limits, but these were only designed to protect against very short exposures and above thermal heating levels. They do not protect and were never designed to, to protect against non-thermal low intensity exposures and, and particularly for prolonged periods. Biological disruption is not linearly proportional to either intensity or frequency. This is a really important take-home fact. I'm going to wind back the clock for a moment to the 70s, where smoking was frightfully good for you, don't you know? Even We, we all told society this, even medical doctors. But we had some really important papers published at that time, really stemming back from the 50s, but more prolific in the 70s, from really credible groups like this uh, military research group. And they found a variety of very important factors. Biological effects were dependent on, we've mentioned frequency, but also polarization of fields. Most natural fields are not polarized, and most man-made fields are. And of course, the characteristics of the biological absorbing tissue, um, reflection and sort of real life 3D effects, and these uh, frequency and amplitude windows. This is uh, connecting with uh, the non linearity of this phenomenon. So you can have lower intensities of radiation that can cause enhanced biological damage. And uh, Leif Salford's work on rats' brains and albumin leakage is really good to understand this a little better. So they noticed these low intensity effects, but also issues with calcium handling, DNA damage, alteration growth rates of certain types of cells, uh, variable sensitivity le levels of different organisms, very important, and central nervous system effects predominating, which we see again and again in the literature. And they point out that some of the frequencies that seem to be maximally interactive coincide with brainwave frequencies. So when all this great work was done back in the 70s, how did this happen? 
this huge proliferation in microwave technologies that's somewhat exponential. We've already covered these points, but to mention a couple more that I think are really important, cumulative exposure, what kind of signal is being emitted, whether it's intermittent or continuous, whether it's pulse modulated or a sine wave, and um, electromagnetic field and chemical synergy. Very important in real life situations because it's all very well doing lots of experiments in a lab, but they often bear no resemblance to the real life uh, ab absorption characteristics that we face. So synergy, as mentioned by Fiorella Belpoggi this morning, I think is really important. We see enhanced effects when different types of waves, so ELF is combined, for example, with ionizing radiation or radio frequency. But also, we've, we can show that RF uh, can be considered in some set situations a co-carcinogen when it's in reacting with other chemical stressors. And of course, in a room, such as a classroom, you've got uh, reflection of fields and interference from multiple dev devices where you have the possibilities for um, constructive or destructive interference, creating hot spots in the room or even within a child's body that are totally unpredictable, that we can't measure, that will change continuously. And there are vulnerabilities. So you guys and the, and the children we're here to discuss are not like the routers that came off the production line. They have individual vulnerabilities that may vary according to their age, sex, sensitivity level, and comorbidity. So to talk about children particularly, their skulls are thinner, which offers less shielding to the delicate brain tissue beneath. Neonates in particular will have a higher water content that can make them far more efficient microwave absorbers. They're physically smaller, of course, so they're more fully enveloped by these fields. And all of their systems are still developing. And we know stem cells in particular are exquisitely sensitive to this kind of radiation. And of course, they have a longer time ahead of them for the latent effects. We know there can be decades from exposure to manifestation, particularly in carcinogenesis. And for the first time, really, we have a generation now that are exposed in utero from conception. This slide just shows the penetration of mobile phone radiation, for example, through the skull of a five-year-old child when compared with an adult. So I said we touch on mechanisms. Um, I think these five mechanisms are really important when we're considering cancer in particular. Oxidative stress, and this has come up quite a lot this morning already, very important. Altered calcium handling, altered gene expression and DNA damage, both genetic and epigenetic in terms of the pathway and inhibition of DNA repair. So on the one hand, you've got increased damage happening, and on the other hand, you've got saturated or impaired repair mechanisms. And I want to briefly mention this really important work done by Professor Martin Paul and at, at the level of the calcium channel, Dimitris Panagopoulos and some others. You can, all I really want you to take note of here is the cyclical nature of this, which allows a positive feedback cycle, which can be very, very dangerous in biology as well as in electronics. And what this work tells us is that electromagnetic fields, specifically non-ionizing electromagnetic fields, can activate voltage-gated calcium channels, opening them up so that calcium can influx into a cell in higher concentrations than it should be. This can set up this destructive feedback loop of nitrosative stress with the production of free radicals. How important is that when we stand back, though, and look at the literature reviews? This is one review from 2015, and they found that 93% of studies that they looked at, where they were looking for oxidative stress in response to these kinds of fields, they found it. So it's becoming increasingly important when you look at uh, literature reviews. I mentioned before that uh, there's a concentration of issues in the central nervous system. We're going up a level here now from cell biology to more systemic pathophysiology. And in particular, I want to mention breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, sympathetic overdrive at the expense of the parasympathetic nervous system, increased cerebral glucose metabolism has been noted, EEG disruption, and so many more that we, we can't discuss them all today. And of course, that serious central nervous system disturbance will have secondary effects on all of your other systems. But to mention a couple of important ones, endocrine disruption and particularly melatonin production, which keys in with one of the excellent lectures earlier. 
very important. And immune suppression, both direct effects and some more indirect ones. Reproductive impairment, very important when we're thinking of children in schools and issues with both male and female fertility. There's been a lot more studies looking at sperm and showing damage to sperm, but some also showing damage to eggs. And when you consider that uh, a little girl is born with all the eggs she'll ever have, if we damage those at some point in her life, that affects her fertility, but obviously potentially damage to subsequent generations. So oxidative stress, we all know, is part of the process of aging and degeneration of cells and tissues. And so therefore, it affects every system in the body. And therefore, should be no surprise that when we move up a, another level and look at disease endpoints, these are all endpoints that have been related to RF exposure in the literature. And in some cases, ELF exposure as well. So when I first put this slide together, very loosely speaking, I put on the right-hand side uh, endpoints that were more likely in the adult population or aging population. And what's really sad is that we're seeing these move into younger and younger age groups. Uh, Dementia is now being di diagnosed in people in their 30s, 40s and 50s. But cancer, migraines, depression, insomnia, escalating in paediatric populations, which we need to take really seriously and, and question why and electromagnetic hypersensitivity, which I'm going to mention because it's a, a subject of specialist interest for me. So EHS is a multi-systemic physical medical condition characterized by increasing sensitivity to electromagnetic fields of uh, increasingly broader frequency ranges at lower and lower intensities. And to translate that a little bit, you can imagine you might have a child that complains of a headache when she's on a mobile phone. If that's left unmanaged, then that child may experience symptoms as the phone moves further and further away, reducing the intensity, and to a broader range of devices. So she may start to get uh, similar symptoms in response to Wi-Fi routers or mobile phone base stations or your smart meter, etc. This is not a psychological condition. It's a physical one. It's been proven in double-blind provocation studies and peer-reviewed. Um, so the nocebo effect is not what's causing this condition. But it is of increasing public health importance. Some of the symptoms that we see commonly, insomnia, headaches, dizziness, tinnitus, um, cardiac palpitations, and many others, which is exactly what we would expect from a radiation-induced condition that will affect every system. But this condition has been marginalized very much in, in the population. Even most doctors think that this is limited to a small subsection, and I would certainly dispute that on the basis of many studies now like this. This one was showing the same constellation, and they're not really non-specific symptoms. They, will, they often get called that, but they're actually not. There's quite a, a relatively specific constellation. And we can see this in a dose-response fashion, depending on how close you live to a mobile phone base station in this particular study. But increasingly, studies looking at the same symptoms, depending on how intensively you use your mobile phone, for example, or smart meter installations, or MRI scanners, or occupational exposures, loads of different, usually pulse modulated RF is one of the most hostile triggers. Why do I bring this up today at a, a cancer conference? Well, I have a couple of different reasons. But when you interview uh, patients, for example, with GBM, let's say, or acoustic neuroma, quite often these patients have a classical history of EHS preceding it, oftentimes for many years. And the two conditions share, share a commonality, which is oxidative stress. So much so that this is being used as a biomarker now when looking at people with the EHS in terms of diagnosis. So this might be really important. It might be that we could predict people in the population or children in the population that might be at higher risk. I don't know. We d this is work that needs to be done. This is only hypothetical. And let's talk about cancer now. So this is quite an old study from 2004, but uh, funded by the European Union. It's the free reflex study. I think many of you might be familiar with this graphic. And I show it really just to remind us that it was quite a while ago that we had some fairly concrete evidence of DNA damage. And you'll see on the far right there the comet-like tail that you can measure the length and breadth of to get an, a quantitative idea of damage. And with only 24 hours of mobile phone radiation, that was really very comparable to the equivalent of about 1,600 chest x-rays. So quite a compelling graphic, and maybe not a surprise that um, a few years later, IARC designated radio frequency specifically as possibly carcinogenic to humans in the group 2B category. And then a year later, 
the World Health Organization predict a quote from them, a tidal wave of cancer. And I find it really interesting to look at the distribution of that there in dark blue in the developed world. So is it a surprise that in 2018, we've got things like this from the CDC pointing out increases in pediatric tumors, including brain, renal, hepatic, thyroid cancers, uh, liver, etc. I'm not trying to imply that RF is the sole cause of this, of course not. But it's certainly, given the huge rises that have taken place, is one of the things that we should really be examining closely. And they mention environmental exposures as a possibility. But let's bring that data closer to home here in the UK. Thank you to Alistair Phillips and Professor Dennis Henshaw, who published this important paper this year, showing rises in GBM, glioblastoma multiforme, in all age groups. Now, that was one of the tumours that Leonard Hardell et al., some, some years ago in 2013, pointed out satisfied the Bradford Hill criteria for causality from RF. The other tumour that he pointed out in this paper was the acoustic neuroma, a type of schwannoma. And you've heard that cell type quite a few times this morning. So that was in 2013. And he, they called, that group called at the time for this to be reclassified as a group one. But IAC have not reconvened since 2011. And that won't happen until they do reconvene, which may take some time. But regardless, in courts of law, this has been gathering momentum and people are winning cases to say that their tumours have been caused by their cell phones. And this has been a really important year for this subject because in terms of what held it back from being a probable 2A carcinogen or a group 1 known carcinogen, it was in part lack of animal data and mechanistic studies. So this year, we got that animal data. This is the NTP study, which has already been mentioned today, and just recently peer-reviewed and strengthened at peer-reviewed to clear evidence of schwannoma of the heart in this case, malignant of the heart, and glioma, some evidence, and adrenal gland, along with a whole load of other tumours that were more equivocal, so prostate, pituitary, heart, uh, lung, liver lymphoma. Um, and so it's becoming increasingly evident that we might be looking at a multi-organ carcinogen here. Followed by the Ramazzini Institute study, and again, thank you to Fiorella Balpoli, Belpoggi, who's already discussed this with you. So I won't go into detail except to say, again, glioma and schwannoma coming up in the literature, reinforcing, cor corroborating what we already knew from the human epidemiological studies, that these cell types are related. So this is uh, still in press, but from Anthony Miller um, and colleagues asking again for this to be now reclassified as a group one carcinogen on the basis that that mechanistic data and the animal studies that they felt were missing back in 2011 are no longer missing. And while we're talking about multi-organ carcinogenesis, I think it's really important we mention this when we're thinking of kids in schools who might be carrying phones in their breast pockets um, of their blazers um, and using devices close to their abdominal organs and their chest, is that uh, this case series was published by John West in the US looking at mobile phones causing breast cancer in very young women, really uh, aggressive tumours. Now, I apologise. This is from the National Office of Statistics, so it's going to be hard for you to read, but... Um, this is looking at males in blue on the top and females underneath in yellow. And I wanted to show it because I think if we're talking about biology of kids, it's useful to know what's, what's the causes of death right now for children in this country. And I used this predecessor to this slide for some years, the 2013 statistics, and I was heartbroken when I downloaded the 2016 version recently and saw that overtaking RTAs as the leading cause of death in nine, 5 to 19-year-olds was suicide. Our children are dying of sadness more than anything else. Next comes RTAs, and below that comes, uh, in males, hematopoietic cancers and lymphoid tumours, and in females, brain cancer, which all can be related to RF radiation. But let's move back to the number one cause of death. So I mentioned to you this um, voltage-gated calcium channel, cellular level pathophysiology. This is linked in here by Professor Martin Paul again to neuropsychiatric effects, including depression. He mentions, among the other effects, depression, so sleep disturbance, concentration loss, headaches, dizziness, burning and tingling in the skin. This is electromagnetic hypersensitivity. That's what this is. It's often called a whole load of other things or sometimes called nothing at all, just a list of symptoms. But that's what we're seeing over and over again. 
And he points out in this year's publication that Wi-Fi is very important in this story. We often talk about mobile phones because that's where a, a bulk of literature used to be, but there's increasing publications on Wi-Fi. And of course, what was very important about the Ramatsini Institute study, that was far field radiation. So it doesn't have to be in the near field to be affecting biology with potential carcinogenesis. In terms of moving forward, I think accountability is going to become increasingly important. And industry have covered their backs, really, in many, many different ways. But they've said, they would be clear, they have never said this technology is safe. And in fact, they do quite the opposite. In your info sections of your own phones and all your other devices, it will tell you that mice who use your device got more cancer and that you need to keep it away from your body by different distances, in some cases up to eight inches, which means you can't really touch the device. Um, are you insured? Well, no. Um, insurance companies are flying from this like bears before a storm, which should tell us something. They're risk an analysts. That's what they do. Should health protection agencies be accountable? Of course they should. And little is happening, but not nothing. So here in this country, the chief medical officer stated many years ago now that children and young people should not be using mobile phones except in emergency situations. But the problem was they didn't tell anyone. They didn't tell you guys. They didn't tell me. They didn't tell parents or governors or teachers. And maybe most importantly, they didn't tell children. And if they're going to issue a warning like that for a smartphone... Why on earth are we not giving warnings for tablets and iPads? Because they can have a higher specific absorption rate or certainly a comparable one to a modern smartphone. And of course, kids are using them down near their very sensitive, unshielded uh, abdominal organs. So I must draw your attention to this really important paper from one of my colleagues, Sarah Starkey. Right now in the UK, the advice that we give is still based on this 2012 report from Agnir. There's been huge criticism internationally of this report, and she published this, which was reviewing the data that they used to make their conclusions. They concluded there are no convincing health effects, nothing convincing. But actually, when you look at the data available to them, 78% of studies looking at male fertility showed damage. Damage to proteins, 94%, and 100% of studies looking at cell membrane dysfunction found it. So how on earth did they come to this conclusion? Well, one concerning fact is that the chairman of Agner at the time was also one of the chairmen for ICNERP, who set the guidelines that he was appraising. An obvious conflict of interest, and we need to move away from issues like this. So moving forward, we need acceptance of low-intensity effects, acknowledgement of important disease endpoints like cancer, accountability and action right now, because so many other countries are taking action. All of these countries have dropped their safety limits by orders of magnitude. And here we are, unforgivably, on the far right of this graph, having done nothing, using outdated thermal effects that weren't fit for purpose then, let alone now. So scientists and doctors are coming together on this issue with multiple appeals. This is the 5G appeal, calling for a moratorium, of, as of course we need, on new emitting technologies. And all of these groups internationally are rich in both quality and quantity. So the majority of intelligent, informed voices on this subject, people published in this area, are all on board that there's a very serious problem. Unfortunately, public health policy is still dictated by minority groups, often with conflicts of interest. We have all of the evidence we need. We have evidence in all these categories, and particularly the three categories that we hold so dear in the scientific community. We're running out of excuses not to move forward on this because we have tens of thousands of research papers. And of course, there's some inconsistency. This is, these are biological systems being looked at in different labs, in different methods all, all over the world. But the majority of them, I would say, demonstrate harm. And that hovers at around 70% in many different areas. But on specific issues, like protein disruption or cell membrane issues or oxidative stress, it's 80 or 90% plus of papers sometimes. In this particular arena, we have abandoned common sense and good scientific integrity. And perhaps most importantly, from a medical doctor's perspective, our me medical code of ethics, because there is a certain level of scientific evidence that IARC needs to redesignate this as a group one. And that will take its time and it will go through the correct procedure. But that is not the same level of evidence that we need as medical doctors to give conscientious advice to our patients. And the reason we're not is purely based on ignorance. It's not because there's not enough evidence. It's because there's too much ignorance. 
So what must we do? I come back to our friend Bradford Hill. All scientific work is incomplete. That does not confer upon us the freedom to ignore the knowledge we already have or to postpone action that it appears to demand at a given time. Such wise words back in the 60s, almost as if he could see where we are right here, right now. So, of course, first of all, we must prevent, and second, we must manage what we fail to prevent. We need to reduce exposure to RF-emitting technology and ELF fields at the same time, improve our hygiene. I'm a member of this new group, UK-based group called IGNIR, developing a set of guidelines. It's, called, it's the International Guidelines on Non-Ionising Radiation. And we comprise medical doctors, scientists, and representatives for vulnerable groups. We are basing our advice on biological data. So it's evidence-based and on um, biological evidence specifically. We take a health-first approach and we'll be adapting our guidelines over time with the literature. But right now, they're focused on the guidance given in the Europa EMF 2016 guideline. It's an excellent document. Please do read it. Published by Igor Belyaev in 2016. So uh, do go see our poster, which is out there, and there's a handout, or there's numerous of us that belong in that group here, so do come and talk to us about um, the group and what we're trying to do. Now, some years ago, I put together this slide, which explained to people how to reduce their personal exposure. But I'll be honest, I think reducing exposure in all of these different ways is a nice idea, but when, when it comes to children, it's a bit like giving them a low-tar cigarette. I, can't, I don't think it's legally defensible in terms of proper protection for a group which, by the way, are often not consenting and not benefiting. So for that group, we should be looking at complete withdrawal of RF emissions and uh, minimizing ELF emissions in, their, in, this, in the places they habituate, in schools, in public spaces, and helping and empowering parents to do this at home. In terms of points of action for my group, FIRE, so this is firemedical.org, and we um, have multiple membership. We're, although we're a medical doctor-based group, we invite people to join from all walks of life. We need all the support we can get. We ask for a rapid re-evaluation. No pressure on Kurt Strafe. I know, I know there are multiple organizations asking for this, and it will take the time it has to take. But we don't need to wait for that. To be very clear, just like all these other countries, we do not need to wait for IARC to reclassify this in order to protect our public and drop our safety limits. We need public statements from Public Health England that are genuinely reflective of the data and explain to people how to reduce their exposure. We need immediate withdrawal of RF and other emissions from, from and nearby schools. And official acknowledgement of the electromagnetic field induced condition of EHS. Induction of education programs to correct this massive gap in knowledge that through no fault of their own, medical doctors will have. An immediate moratorium on new emitting technologies like 5G and smart metering programs. And a zero tolerance approach to industrial influences on public health policy. This is a no-brainer, and it's astonishing to me it's still happening, but it is. And so where do we start? Because that is a big, long list, and it can feel very overwhelming. Well, let's follow our international colleagues. Let's follow France with getting Wi-Fi out of schools and phones, following Russia with dramatically lower public safety limits, following Sweden with legislation changes that protect vulnerable and sensitive groups, following Cyprus with fantastic government-backed information campaigns for schools and parents, following the USA with specific drawn-up pediatric statements. And, um, and following Italy with uh, legal action in courts of law that is leading to compensation and protection. So in summary, low intensity effects or non-thermal effects are damaging biology. Present safety standards are not just protective, they don't exist to cover that, that health interaction. Related multi-systemic diseases are rising, and this includes cancer, and children are especially vulnerable. Hardwired connectivity must be immediately used to protect vulnerable groups, especially when we're looking at schools. Accountability is evolving, and I would suggest that the medical doctors in this room might want to take notice of this, because at some point, they could also be held accountable. Further RF deployment is unforgivably irresponsible at this point, and often the precautionary principle gets banded around. And I think it's a very important principle, don't get me wrong, but I just think it's completely inappropriate right now for this, simply because the time for precaution is way past. 
The time for precaution was in the 50s and 60s and 70s when the literature was emerging and exposures hadn't risen yet. This can't be called precautionary. We've exposed an entire generation of children to non-ionizing radiation at intensities that in some cases can be measured at a billion billion or a quintillion times higher than natural background radiation. And we have tens of thousands of research papers now that give us serious cause for concern. So this is not precautionary. This is an emergency now to protect health, not just of the generation that we're responsible for to come, but subsequent generations given the nature of this toxin. So please do join my group if you are interested in being part of the solution to this and moving forwards. Specifically, we're creating guidance documents, supporting medical professionals, educators and parents, achieving funding, we hope, for research, um, providing advice to other medical professionals, facilitating the construction of academic programs for medical professionals, providing, promoting and uh, supporting awareness campaigns and lectures, and uh, maintaining our global academic connections, which is so important given that many countries are way ahead of us on this issue. So after decades of failure, I really think it's time. This is the right place, and now is definitely the right time, to take the first steps forward to responsibly protecting our children. Thank you so much for listening. Time-wise, I don't know how I did. <laughs>